So this brings us to chapter 19. And this is kind of a nice image to start the chapter because we're talking about microbes and their interactions. And this is a periphyton biofilm on, um, and it's electron micrograph. Uh, and it's a mo mostly diatoms that you can see here. The, um, You can kind of see the lines, so electron micrographs can get really small, but they've, they've basically taken a whole panorama of this and pushed and, and um, knitted them all together to make a, a big image of it to get an idea. So this is maybe a uh, half millimeter thick, the whole thing from top to bottom to give you an idea of scale. And we have these filamentous diatoms like Melosyra. <clears throat> Um, this one's one of my favorite, epithemia. It has this sort of S shape to it. Um, you can see a lot of it in there. I really like that one. Some smaller ones, navicula in here. And then this extra poly, uh, this mucopolysaccharide stuff that they pump out to kind of hold everything together. So you can imagine that the interactions between these, um, among all these organisms are, are really complex and, um, you have molecular diffusion dominating here, right? Because of all this gel and stuff. So, it, they, but they're close to each other, so they'll interact with each other within this. But they can also compete very strongly as well. And you can see very small ones, and you can even see the little, very smallest things you can see in here, probably bacteria. So we're going to talk about how interactions occur among microorganisms, and then as animals interact with them as well. And the first part of its behavior, and then the different interaction types, importation and parasitism, competition, mutualism, chemical mediation. So the first thing that you have to be able to do, I mean, is make a choice between whether you stay or you go, right? So some organisms, can sit still and never move like a plant or move not very much like a plant, um, or they can be modal like us and microbes are no exception. Some of them move quite um, actively. And remember, it's pretty, must be pretty important because when we talked about Reynolds numbers, uh, bacterium swimming in water at that scale is about like us swimming in tar at our scale. So it's just, a tremendous amount of energy output to move, but there, so there must be tremendous benefits evolutionarily to doing so. Um, so responses to stimuli can be either um, phobic or tactic, um, or positive or negative. You, you, can, you can, the terminology works that way. Um, so taxis is moving um, towards something. So phototaxis would be uh, moving towards light uh, and negative phototaxis or a photophobic response would be moving away from light. Geotaxis is moving down towards gravity. Um, chemotaxis, uh, go moving towards negative chemotaxis or a chemophobic response would be moving away from. And magnetotaxis is moving towards magnetic fields. And all, all of these things happen in the microbes. We can talk about phototaxis just real quickly. I'll ask a quick question, one of my many questions of the day. Why, why would an organism want to be positively phototactic? That one's fairly easy, I think. And why would an organism want to be negatively phototactic? So we've got some good answers on this. Um, moving towards light, it's pretty obvious that, you, that if you're photosynthetic, you want to move towards light, unless the light levels are too high. So we've had a number of times where we've talked about photo inhibition and, and high elevation lakes um, and, and, and watermelon snow, um, you know, the, the snow algae can really get blasted out. And, and then you might want to move away from light at that point. You also, somebody mentioned you might want to move down to get nutrients and that you might get more. Um, there's another thing that happens, a lot of anoxic organisms, uh, obligate anaerobes are actually negative phototactic. Um, and so anybody have any guesses why that might be? 
So if you're an obligate anaerobe, that means you have to be in, in uh, no oxygen environment. And if, many of them might kill them. And this is for moving away from light? Yeah, photophobic response. Because things that use light are photosynthetic? Exactly. And so they're producing oxygen, right? So you don't want to be where there's going to be light because the chances are there's going to be oxygen. So that's the other answer. Um, other reason that things might move away from light as well. Um, and then you can think about geotaxis. Um, if you, we talked a little bit already, Tom mentioned that cyanobacteria can, where we, we move, can move towards nutrients and they do so by collapsing their gas vacuoles and that would be basically a way to sink down with gravity. Or build your, you could build your, the negative geotaxis, I guess you could build up your gas vacuoles and go up towards the surface, right? Uh, but there's other organisms that do that. Basically, anything that uh, wants to be benthic would be going towards the bottom, right? They want to stay on the bottom. Um, so you can imagine that that would be a way. Chemotaxis, you can imagine there's some chemicals you want to go towards. If they're sugar and you're a, you know, you're a yeast or something, or a bacterium that, that needs sugar, then you go towards it. Um, if there's a predator or some sort of nasty chemical, you go away from it. We'll talk about how you do that. And then I'll go more to more detail about the magnetotaxis just because it's kind of cool. So how fast do organisms move? Well, you know, you can think about um, velocity straight up in meters per second, or you can think about relative velocity. So how far, how fast are you going relative to the size you are? So there's two ways to think about that. Um, and so this is the first columns in meters per second, and the second one is in body lengths per second. So desmids, uh, we saw, can glide along stuff, sort of, you know, not very fast, 0.01 body lengths per second. And the amoeba are sort of the same, they can kind of ooze along slowly. Gliding bacteria can speed it up a little bit, and diatoms can also glide. Um, so these Diatoms that are in the back I've got here are the ones we saw earlier in the lecture. Many of them are mobile, um, and they, they're able to get on the surface and, and move forward. Cyanobacteria can glide, or they can float. So you can measure how fast, if a, back, a cyanobacterium creates gas vacuoles, how fast it's able to float up to the surface. Um, so so this, those speeds are, again, getting kind of slow. <laughs> Um, we only get a, a, the ability to go a body length per second when we start getting into some of these active swimmers like the carps and the eels. And the trouts are starting to get up to eight body lengths per second. Salmon are even better. They can go up to six meters per second and 10 body lengths per second. But if you look at ciliated protozoa, um, they're able to go 10 body lengths per second too, even though they're, but they're small, so that, you know they're not really going six meters per second, but they're, but they're going pretty fast. And bacteria, 20. And the fastest um, in body lengths per second of, of the swimming organisms is copepod. And they have burst speeds of up to 200 body lengths per second. They can um, <clears throat> use these in the escape, uh, escape uh, to get away from predators. They're pretty small, they're right. They're not really up in that turbulent um, zone of, of of the um, of Reynolds numbers. So what would you do if you were chemotactic? Why are you swimming around and how would you get there? <clears throat> the most common mode of, of chemotaxis, and actually some phototaxis can work this way too, but mo mostly chemotaxis, is the random walk model of chemotaxis. And essentially what the organism does is it keeps going the same direction as long as things are getting better. And if they're not getting better, it tumbles randomly and then starts in a new direction. It may be in a new direction. It's random, so it could be the same direction. So the organism needs to be able to integrate the, the um, signal over time. They need to have a memory of time, right? Because they, to, to know if it's getting better, if there's more sugar, you know, or something like that that you're after, you have to know that it was this at this time and this the next time. And you, also you have to be able to reset that clock, right, to get your background, because it, once you get into the better, you want to get into even better, right? So that needs to be your new baseline. So those, those are some of the things that you need to do. 
So to give an example here, um, these organisms take, this one's swimming around, takes a short run, and it's like, no, nothing's changing, nothing's changing, random, random. See, they're not going straight towards the source right here. So this is the diffusive source right here. Nothing's changing, nothing's changing. And all of a sudden they get in the edge of it, right? Oh, okay, things are getting better, they're getting better. Well, wait a minute, they're not getting better, they're not getting better, I'm gonna go randomly. But again, because it's randomly, they just end up going away from it. And then, no, that didn't work, randomly going, still not getting much better, and then randomly getting a lot better, right? And then getting worse again, so tumble again. And eventually, if it's a bunch of bacteria or something swimming towards a, a sugar cube or something, then they all end up here. But, it, but, the, but it's random. It also works under directional flow. So even if you have a moving um, flow, you can get this randomness and then things are getting better, no, they get worse, tumble around, things are getting better, no, they get worse. And even large organisms, it's, it's not just microorganisms. So um, salmon use this to find their, their um, river that they were born in and they hatched in and, and they're returning to spawn. They'll just sort of randomly swim around and then, you know, if it gets better, they keep moving that way. And if not, then they kind of pick a new direction and go. So it's, so it's, uh, and yeah, so this is a, this is a pretty common way. Um, there's some other ways you can do it. You can just basically have a simple rule. I move if things are good and I sit, if, if the things are good, I sit, sorry, I sit still. And if things are getting bad, I, I move. So that's a real common one for things that are attached to solid surfaces and can detach and move. They'll just say, okay, things suck now, I'm leaving. Um, oh, they're great, I'm gonna stay until, it's, until it gets bad. So that's a simpler um, way to do it. Okay, I promise I talk about magnetotaxis. Um, so here's a bacterium that contains magnetosomes and these allow it to align itself along the uh, Earth's axis of magnetic axis. And the way this works is that if you look at the magnetic field on Earth, it has a, uh, it has a vertical component to it, a downward component. So if you're right at the pole, I mean, sorry, at the equator, it doesn't do you any good to be magnetotactic if you want to use it to go down. So these are benthic bacteria and they want to go down. And if you're right at the equator, it doesn't do you any good to follow north or south, right? Because you just, you're just going laterally. But if you're in the northern hemisphere and you go north, you'll go north, but you'll also go down at the same time. So you'll diagonally way down into, into the sediment, towards the sediment. Um, the guy that figured this out was looking at marine bacteria under the microscope and they'd all go one direction. He couldn't figure out why. And he tried all these things and then randomly he put a magnet there and it, they, it changed their direction. Um, so if they're in the southern hemisphere, what direction should they go if they want to find the benthic habitat? South, good Trevor, yeah. And you know, what will happen actually is that if you take a culture of bacteria and you always select the ones that are going, well, if you're in the, if, if you, in the um, northern, northern hemisphere bacteria, right, they're going north, and you put them in a situation where you flip the magnetic field on them and they, you harvest the ones that go south, you can just get the mutation to go and, and the population will be, will be taken over by those that move south. And this, this is pretty cool. They're actually even thinking of using these little magnetosomes uh, that bacteria make, you know, attaching drugs to them. And then you can shoot a drug in, into the circulatory system of a person and put a magnet right where you want it to go and the magnetosome will stick there and put the drug right on, you know, like it's a tumor or something like that. You want to, want to get that drug there without, and put, put a toxin in your body, but never, never have it concentrated unless you're right at that tumor. You can physically do that. Um, so down would be towards the uh, core of the earth. Well, yeah, but if you're in the ocean and you're, uh, or a lake and you're a benthic bacterium um, and you need to be on the bottom to really survive, then you want to go down. And that's, and you're going to stop. You're going to get stuck when you hit the bottom of the lake, so you're not going to get bored at the center of the earth. That's true. And no, Emma, the earth is not flat. <laughs> Though some people believe it is. Okay, so um, this says interaction types in microbial communities, but really 
um, it's it's a classification that works for all kinds of, of interactions. Um, and the first one, uh, interactions among organisms, and we'll build on this throughout the next several chapters. Density mediated ones are ones that are based on the density of the organisms. And trait mediated ones are ones that are already there um, through evolution that basically can drive, uh, drive behavior. So we'll talk about competition for nutrients. Um, that would be a density mediated mediated interaction um, or uh, pre a predator that is keying in on the more dense population of prey. A trait mediated um, interaction would be if you, um, I don't know, we, have, we had for example Daphnia putting, making spines uh, to, to avoid predation in, in the response to fish chemicals, right? That's an evolutionary trait. You don't have to actually be eaten before that happens. In, in another way to look at it are direct versus indirect interactions. So we talked about um, commensalism and we talked about neutralism, like many organisms, and there, there's a lot of zero interactions out there is what I'm trying to get at. A lot of times you don't interact directly with the other organisms. So uh, example for humans, um, we grow soybeans and they're useful because they have nitrogen fixing bacteria in them. We don't directly interact with the nitrogen fixing bacteria for the most part. We interact directly with the soybean, but there's an inter indirect interaction because we're planting and encouraging the soybeans and the bacteria are encouraged as well. So that would be an indirect interaction versus an in in direct interaction between two species uh, would, be would, would be just between those two species. So you build direct interactions, a uh, chain of them to make an indirect interaction. Okay, so we're gonna go through predation and parasitism and talk about a variety of different kinds of things. First being viruses, uh, and then how do you deal with consuming small cells because it's different than um, getting big things. And talk about detritivores and filter feeders, uh, selectivity of particle feeders, and microbial adaptations to avoid predation, and a little bit on parasitism and other exploitations. Um, when we're talking about organisms that are eating other microorganisms, it changes the way we view the world. And in limnology and also in oceanography, the classic view of the world was this traditional food web where nutrients stimulate phytoplankton that you can catch in a net, and then zooplankton eat those. Maybe you'll have a carnivorous zooplankton um, you know, or something like Leptodora or, or uh, you know, the phantom midge or some, something like that, some smaller plankton. Um, and then eventually the, the fish that eat the zooplankton will eat those and the fish that eat the fish will eat those. So you just have this nice line of uh, chain uh, of response. And then each of these things is excreting. So they're dumping their nutrients back out again and the cycle starts again. Okay, so that's, that's the simple view of things. As our technology came up and we got things like electron microscopes and ways to, to um, label bacteria and see them, we started to realize that there was a whole different world out there that we didn't know about. And so when I was in graduate school, which was a while ago now, um, people started realizing that there are things called picophytoplankton, that the stuff we caught in the net was not all there was. And there's a bunch of bacteria-sized plankton out there. But to go back to this image right here, these little red dots are bacteria-sized algae that you know traditionally taxonomists wouldn't have seen because they're just, just these little blobs, right? Well, they're floating around all over in the ocean and all over in lakes, um, and a good portion of, of the ocean. And these are bacteria-sized, basically, right? So they're, they're very small. Well, they can be quite important. Um, before, people didn't see this stuff so much because they just pulled plankton nets through and you can only have so fine of a mesh until you get the Reynolds number making it so you can't really pull stuff through there anymore. And then people start realizing, you know, there's these picophytoplankton out here and there's all these bacteria out here. 
what if nobody ate them? What would happen if nobody ate those things? Anybody? They would take over, right? The whole, all the carbon and nutrients would be tied up. If nothing ate the picophytoplankton or the bacteria, all the nutrients and the carbon would be tie, tied up in all that. There wouldn't be a food web, Abigail. There would not be a disruption. There just wouldn't be one. Nobody ate it. So all the nutrients would get shunted into one place, right? And it just, it wouldn't work. But protozoan rotifers eat these small particles and they're able to um, cycle the nutrients. This is called the microbial loop. And the reason it's a loop is that there's this carbon and nutrient loop where they're cycling nutrients, they're taking it up, cycling it back, taking it up, cycling it back, all within this, the microbe side of things. And it turns out that most food webs really are based this way, that you can think of the food web being the microbial spinning like a wheel, right? And cycling, cycling, cycling. And then the, the animals on top are plucking stuff off. So unless you've got a terrestrial system where you've got big plants to start with and big animals eating them, right? Everything else, the stuff that's going on in the soil, the stuff that's going in wetlands, groundwaters, lakes, oceans, all that just tends to be microbes cycling stuff really quickly and pulling a little, and then the, the larger organisms, the animals, getting a little bit of that off the top. And so this is a much more complex. And we're also going to talk about food chains versus food webs. And this is an example of a web, more of a web than a chain. So this is the modern view versus the old-fashioned view. We'll still go back to this when we talk about things like top-down control of primary production. And it's easier to imagine when you're thinking about it as a chain than it is uh, as, as a web. Microbes are important. So we'll be taking that a main take-home point here. The other thing that happened was viruses were, were essentially discovered as being more than just things that, that infect humans or livestock or maybe you know, aquaculture. Um, when, we, when people started looking at um, samples that were filtered from lakes uh, with electron microscopes, they started to see these virus-sized particles that looked just like the, the ones that we knew were pathogenic. All organisms have viruses. It's very ancient pre predator or parasite or whatever you want to call it. Um, and there are times when it may control algal blooms and bacterial populations. So we'll see, um, we'll see algal blooms that will just collapse. And sometimes it's because of fungal infection, but sometimes it's probably because of viruses. We just don't really know. Um, <clears throat> So I mentioned it can be a problem in fish aquaculture. You get some viruses that cause some big problems and, and they have to, you know, basically either shut the thing down or some, somehow completely sterilize or sanitize the system. Um, so I, just like everything else, if, some, if viruses couldn't be eaten, right, or couldn't, couldn't be cycled back into the food web, eventually everything would end up being in viruses all the time carbon and nitrogen because remember the viruses are made up of DNA or RNA and they can have a proteinaceous coat you know, or a lipid coat um, but all the nitrogen phosphorus carbon would end up in viruses but some protozoa can engulf viruses and actually eat them they're, they're quite quite important sometimes they're called nano, nano flag, heterotrophic nanoflagellates and they're, they're, they're very very small flagellates and they're eating really really tiny particles um, it's also important to understand this because um, human disease viruses can survive in water as well. Some of them can withstand oxygen, others can't. <clears throat> I was just reading about how coronavirus can, can survive in water and there a uh, number of universities are sampling the uh, sewage that's coming out of each of the dorms and using that, the um, coronavirus to see if um, the, the pe somebody in that dorm has coronavirus and then they can they can do that rather than testing everybody right so it's a they're doing a car at state university and a number of other universities around the country viruses tend to be inactivated in the natural environment over time and we would already talked about that some so um some get inactivated by oxygen um some might be consumed by protozoa 
uh, others might, ultraviolet light might be harmful to them. Um, or they could just get stuck on the wrong thing. Um, so an example would be an, an al algae, um, a virus that, that is specific to one species of algae. If it's pretty successful, it's going to be breaking out of the cells, right, as it lyses and goes out and tries to infect other algal cells. Then there's pieces of algal cell floating around. So another virus doesn't know that. It just has the, the protein or whatever it's zooming in on. It'll just bind to that. And then it thinks it's on a cell and it's not, or it doesn't think, but it, 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 its program says you're on a cell and you know inject the, the DNA or the RNA. And um, <clears throat> so, yeah, should we all go tanning if we get COVID? Yeah, that's probably about along the same line as um, injecting bleach, I would say. Um, yeah, so uh, there's this there's this this trade-off between how long they can live in the environment and, and how tough the environment is. Um, and this is why well, how epidemiology works, right? When you have dense organism organisms, the viruses can travel from one to the next before they become inactivated. Um, just as we, you know, we know from COVID, not having large, large aggregations of people, or if you can slow the transmission a little bit by putting in the mask, you essentially discipline people um, that way. It's really important because sometimes they grab genetic material and move it across taxonomic lines. So we talked about this blurring of taxonomy that happens, um, and there are even examples of tax. Um, of DNA that's moved from like bacteria into eukaryotes, but um, really important in, in potentially lateral transfer of genes. And that's why it gets difficult to use molecular methods to get taxonomy. Did the study of virus water in universities mention if you could potentially get infected with the water? It didn't, I presume so. Um, I don't think anybody's gonna be drinking sewage coming out of dorms, so it's not a huge worry. Um, but it is true that, that people that work in sewage treatment plants do tend to get viruses more often until they get, until they get um, resistant to that because that stuff gets, um, you know, when the air bubbles and stuff like that aerosolize that stuff, they'll breathe it in. So your chances of getting sick are a little bit higher if you work in a sewage treatment plant. <clears throat> Not gonna repeat what Emma said this time. Okay. So here's the kind of thing that people saw with electron micrographs. Um, they saw these particles and they thought they might be viruses. Uh, and they did some experiments where they'd filter them out and they'd throw them in an algal uh, culture and boom, you know, the production went down. And then they'd also do electron micrographs. This is a bacterium. And each one of these things on here is actually a virus. And you can see they're all attached on there trying to get their DNA in there or RNA, depending upon what kind of virus they are. Get it, getting it in there and and, uh, and infect that that cell. So everything has its viruses. Okay, now we're going to talk about consumption of small cells and particles. Remember Reynolds numbers. When it's really small, the solution's viscous. So you can't filter things out. Um, if we have two filters, one that has a 0.2 micron diameter and one that has a five micron diameter, and just try to filter ultra pure water through, it's gonna go way through faster through this five micron one than the 0.2 micron because it's so viscous at that small scale getting through those little pores, it's not gonna be able. So an organism can't just use some kind of comb or, or net or something when, when, when it's down in the micron range, right? It's just the, water's all going to flow around the outside of it. It's not going to flow through it and trap things like it does when you have a net or a comb. If an organism's too large, it won't fit, fit in the mouth. <clears throat> and so the fish ecologists know this is a gape limitation. The fish can't eat anything bigger than a gape, but it's true for, you know, Daphne or a protozoa or whatever is trying to eat something. If it's too big, it won't fit. Never eat anything bigger than your head, I think is what they say. It's also a function of particle com, uh, concentration <clears throat> and quality. So organisms pick and choose what they eat. They don't just, um, they just don't eat anything. Um, they'll, they'll eat uh, nutritious food if they can tell it's nutritious and over poor quality food. 
the very greatest rates of microbial um, uh, it, consumption are when the entire assemblage is consumed. So we have like periphyton, for example, the snail that just eats all the, everything that's in there, the bacteria and everything. It's not worried about, um, or even an earthworm or a, a, a oligochaetin and sediment, it's just gonna process everything and it'll take a lot in. And we'll see that in a little bit. Okay, so here's a variety of um, ciliated protozoans. Paramecium, Codotum, um, maybe you've seen Bursaria, sometimes that one's in, in print, uh, intro biology labs. And if we look at the x-axis, we have particle diameter. It's on log scale. So this is about the size of a bacterium right here. The virus is somewhere down in here. Um, this is 100 microns would be the size of the cells of many of these things, actually. Um, and this is the maximum rate they can pump water, basically move stuff through. They don't really pump water, but how, many, how much water volume they can process, if you will, to, pull out, um, to pull out particles. And we see that um, the clearance rate of, of bacteria, um, so what they do is they put, uh, you know, like a 0.2 micron particle in a beaker, and then they, met, and they put the protozoa in there, and then they measure how fast it gets taken out, right? How, how quickly it's turning over in per, per cell. You know, they put 100 in there, they got 100 mils, they can get volume cleared per hour where they took all the particles out. We see these small particles, most of them have pretty much trouble with. Um, this colopidium is probably the winner, is probably the best uh, zoomed in on the smallest particles. Um, and then maybe, um, maybe the uh, glaucoma, but then you see this one, the uh, uh, paramecium canatum is, is sort of specializing on bacteria sized particles. Um, this one right here, oops, this other um, euploides is, is, and uh, what's the other one, blepharisma, look like they're continuing to do better. I don't know if they, they didn't really continue the experiment to get the, uh, downward trend here. And then this very large one, Bursaria, is, is, is basically eating fairly good sized algae. What does clearance rate mean on the y-axis? Did I answer that already, Tom, or do you need me to expl explain that better? Sorry, you, you may have, I must have missed it. Oh, okay. So the clearance rate is basically how quickly the, um, how much volume of water each cell can can process each hour right so to measure it you put in some kind of you know one micron particles in 10 mils and you put in 10 uh, paramecium and then you look at how quickly it takes them to remove all of those and you know all, all 10 of all, all 10 of those paramecium um, from from the from the solution Okay, so clearance, clearing, clearing the water of those particles, whatever size they are. Any other questions? That's a good question. Okay, um, and then organisms also alter their rate of consumption based on the um, particle concentration. So we see on the left hand, we see a protozoan, and um, you know, when particle, when Concentrations are low, the number of particles per mil, um, the number of particles taken up per hour uh, is low, and as you increase, it goes up, and at some point, it levels off. How do they measure this? Uh, there's a couple ways. You can take bacteria and look at how quickly they're taken out of the solution, like I just talked about. You can use uh, microbeads, like Sean talked about, um, or in some of the microplastics that they make, and put fluorescent dyes on them and look at, really physically look at with the microscope how quickly they get in the cells. Or you can take bacteria and put fluorescent dyes on. There's, a, there's several different techniques. So why do you think this levels off up here? Why do you think it doesn't just keep shooting up? It's full. Right. Good. Yeah, so there's a salad bar, right? You can only as fast as you can, back when there were salad bars we could all go to. 
you can only eat as much as you can eat, right? You're just not going to eat faster and faster and faster. And, and it's just not, not physically possible. I think they do want to get fat lane. They just can only physically do so much. They can only process and eat so much, but maybe not. You know, they, the nice thing about being a protozoan is that you don't have to get fat. You can just divide, make two, and then move on, right? So you don't have to worry about it. Okay, so then we'll look at a filter feeder, um, Daphnia, and look at how fast it's, it's filtering rate. That is how, how many uh, cubic centimeters of water it's, it's, it's able to process per hour. And compare that to the ingestion rate. And, we, and this is being fed algae at different concentrations, number of cells per cubic centimeter or milliliter, if you want, same thing. <clears throat> And we see that at low concentrations, they're really working hard to filter, but they're not getting much in. So here's the filtering rate on this one, the ingestion rate's over here, the ingestion rate's low, filtering rate is high. As there's more and more food available, their ingestion rate levels off and their filtering rate drops to almost nothing. So why spend the energy to collect a bunch of food if there's so much food that you can't process it and eat it anyway, right? So, so that's the other thing that happens. <clears throat> um, sometimes, this one thing that's missing here is sometimes if food is super, super scarce, they'll just shut down altogether. They'll just go, this is not worth the energy. I'm gonna wait until it gets better or swim, try to swim somewhere else where, it, where it's better. And then we can just talk about consumption by, by um, the number of bacteria per animal per hour. And we can see that, as I mentioned, those that are out eating sediments, right, are getting quite a bit more than things like microflagellates because these are really small and they have to pick, pick individual ones. Whereas these are large and they can eat large assemblages of bacteria. And just for fun, this is the filtering apparatus of a rotifer. If you're a small alga, this would be terrifying to you, right? Because those things would be spinning the water around and you get stuck and then you go into the mouth and down the gullet. Okay, so how, how do you avoid predation? <clears throat> and these are uh, for microbes, but a lot of these are gonna um, apply to macroscopic organisms as well. <clears throat> so you can mechanically, you can be either too small or too large. So those, those picophytoplankton we talked about in the microbial loop, part of the reason they're successful is a lot of things like Daphnia can't get them out. And you know, the protozoa can, but then the Daphnia might be eating the protozoa, right? So, so there's, you can be too small. <clears throat> or you can be too large, the gape limitation thing. You can make yourself too large by synthesizing spines. We'll talk about that in a sec. There's also a lot of chemical, um, <clears throat> chemical ways to get around being eaten. Uh, toxins are a big one. I mean, you've got to be in the majority of the community. So a toxin will work if either you're a single cell that a protozoan is going to eat, and that's going to kill the protozoan. And so it should have a way to sense that, right? Or if you're <clears throat> in... Uh, like a cyanobacterial bloom, right, where the whole thing's toxic, so nothing's going to eat you. But if you're just one cell in, the, in a mass of toxic cell in a mass of very edible things, and something big comes to eat you, it'll just eat everything. That's kind of like us eating hot chilies in, in, uh, you know, in, our, in, in our food, that we wouldn't eat nothing but hot chilies, but um, you know, maybe one or two wouldn't be so bad. <clears throat> The other thing you can do is be poor quality. Um, this works better for larger organisms, but if you're really low nitrogen phosphorus alga and you, you synthesize a bunch of extra carbon, um, maybe put a big gel blob around the outside of you or something like that, that you know, just doesn't makes it hard for you to be digested and, and used up, you can, you can use that. And remember, I mentioned that microbe uh, that that things that eat microbes will pick and choose. So those experiments that I talked about 
one experiment that they did to look at ingestion of cells by protozoa, they used fluorescently labeled plastic beads and bacteria, both of the same size, and the plastic beads were rejected more often than the bacteria were. So somehow they're able to say good quality food, bad quality food, you know, eat it, don't eat it. <clears throat> and then when you get a little bit bigger, you can escape, if you can move fast enough to get away from organisms. Okay, so there's predation. <clears throat> And now we'll talk about um, competition. And there's exploitation versus interference competition. So another, another classification of an interaction. <laughs> so when, you when you're competing for a nutrient, if you're just eating all the nutrient you can, right, then that would be exploitation competition. If you put out an allele chemical, a toxin that knocks back your, pre your competitor, that would be interference competition. If you dump some sort of nasty chemical in the environment to gum it up or something. And then we'll talk more about allele chemicals and research ratio theory. Okay, so now we're gonna come back to the Monod equation where we had the concentration of a nutrient on the x-axis, the independent variable. The dependent variable being the growth rate of the organism. And in this case, we have silicon and we have phosphorus. And we have a situation where species two is trading off, right? It takes up nutrients well, phosphosilicate well at low concentrations, but not as well at high concentrations. And that flips for species one. So which species wins at high silicon? all things considered. Species one, which species wins at low phosphorus? Uh, which species wins at low phosphorus? Right, so if you have an environment that has lots of silicon, and not much phosphorus. Who's going to be who's going to be the winner? Winner. Right. Species one. Well, what if you're in a environment, the opposite environment, high phosphorus, um, low silicon? Who's going to win? Species two. Okay. Then the last question: Under which conditions does neither species have the advantage? Mm, not high both. Right, high, high or low both, right? So, so what you have to have is this balance. And so we'll go ahead and that the next. So this is Dave Tillman. Uh, Tillman's idea of resource ratio theory. And there's a little bit of a complex graph, so we'll step through it. Oh, wait, it's so exciting. You know what? I'm going to stop because we just got up to 18 minutes after. And we will pick up on this. And it's, it's, it's kind of a tricky one. So we'll pick up on it when 